please turn the pages of your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We will be considering a large chunk of scripture this morning, but it's a method to my madness, if you will. Mark chapter 1 from verse 40 to chapter 2 verse 17. Now, as we read earlier on in our service, the passage in 2 Kings chapter 5 about the Syrian commander, General Naaman, who was a leper. And as the story goes, as great a man as he was, he had this issue that affected him and limited his interaction in society. Now, the word leper in the Bible didn't just mean what we understand by leprosy as those who maybe lost limbs and fingers and so on. Um, there's different ways of understanding, but it meant a skin disease, some kind of skin ailment. But nonetheless, one that rendered the individual as being unclean. And this man, upon hearing that through one of the um, slave girls that they actually took as a result of a raid um, upon Israel, let them know of the healing power of the God of Israel, Yahweh. And so he goes there. And as we saw earlier on, his king sent a letter, gave him a letter to give to the king of Israel that he's sending him there to be cleansed of his leprosy. And how did the king of Israel respond? Am I God? Am I God that he was send his commander to me to ask me to do something that we all know this is the realm of God. And in his mind, the king of Syria was actually provoking war. He was trying to pick a fight. But as we know, as we read and as, uh, how the story goes, Elisha, the man of God, hears about this. And you can almost see him rolling his eyes as like, oh, this king is pathetic. Just bring, bring that guy to me. Bring him to me. He had no respect for the king of Israel, you could tell. These were dark days in the nation's history, the time of Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha doesn't even go out to see him, just tells him, go and dip in the river Jordan seven times, and Bob's your uncle. And the man is insulted by this, as he believes they have better rivers, and he didn't even have the, the dis decency to come out and meet him. And did you hear what he said? I mean, why didn't he just come out here and wave his hands? You know, do some magic. And even if that's not important to the healing process, just do it, because it looks good. And wisely, his servant said to him, hey, just do what the guy says. And he did. And we read, we read rather, that when he dipped the seventh time, came out of the waters, his skin was like that of a baby's. As I mentioned earlier on, the title of today's message is The Disease No Man Can Cure. The Disease No Man Can Cure. And always in scripture, leprosy is always used as symbolic of sin and its effect upon the individual and also upon society. And that person was always ostracized from society because that disease is eating the man himself but also it could affect other people it was limited this social interaction and it's a good picture I think as well of the sinner and this morning we want to bring you a message of hope 
Maybe you're sitting there this morning, whoever you are listening to this message, and you're thinking, I'm not a religious person, so God will not pay any attention to a person like me. I'm not a good person. My family don't even like me. Maybe you're a sex worker. Maybe you're a gangster. Maybe you have been involved in some deviant activities in the past or presently. Maybe you're sitting there right now, drunk out of your mind, promising for the hundredth time, this is your last drink. But you know, you're still, you're still gonna have drink 101 and possibly 102 and possibly 103. Maybe you're struggling in some shape or form that has kept you away from even considering the message of the gospel or darkening the doors of a church because you know you're flawed. And you sit there in your mind reasoning out as might as well stay away and maybe even you hate the church, you hate Christianity because you know you can't save yourself. And maybe you are a Christian. You know, you're already blood bought. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb. So Joshua, what's my excuse? Because you're still being sanctified. And so you're sitting there thinking, I want to give up on all of this. I'm sure no one else in this chapel is experiencing what I'm experiencing right now. And maybe you sit there feeling alone because everybody else looks holy and righteous. Especially those in the suits. You know, those people. And especially those, you know, they're, they're at every meeting unlike you. Maybe you've not been to church in the past two months or once in the past two weeks. Maybe you've not been reading your Bible properly or at all. Your dust still carries the dust of May. Maybe you've not been praying at all. And every time that pastor of yours screams about corporate prayer meeting, boy, you feel convicted. And you're praying this morning, he doesn't touch on that subject again. Maybe you're not the best husband or the best wife. Or the most obedient children. I'm hoping this message is a reminder to how you were saved. And by whose power you are kept. Amen. I'm hoping this is a message of hope. To remind us, to refresh our minds about who we are, how we got here. This is a message for everyone. And maybe you are that person, sat there, you love your husband, you love your wife, you love your children, you give time to your family, you, you're there every Bible study, you read your Bible, you study your Bible, you're, you just seem to be on point for everything. There's a message in there for you as well to remind you from the gutter of sin from which you were delivered. Lest you slip into self-righteousness and look down your nose upon those who you think do not measure up. What we'll see this morning are three men. In fact, we could preach a sermon on each man because there's so much to consider. But I believe there's a purpose and an intentionality about the way which Mark has ordered his gospel account that I reckon we miss the beauty of what he's doing by putting these stories one after the other in one block. And I think he's saying the same thing and I want us to see what I believe Mark is actually saying to us. Because sometimes we can get bogged down in the details and miss the woods for the tree, as they say. Well, read with me. I'm going to read pretty fast. And let me encourage you to go away in your own time to read it slowly again. 
and consider the point of the message we're going to be looking at today. Mark chapter 1, from verse 40, and it reads, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Chapter 2 verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who could forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he arose immediately, picked up his bed and went up before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this he went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them and as he passed by he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax booth and he said to him follow me and he rose and followed him and as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The context of Mark, especially the portion we're looking at, is in the section of Mark's account where we're trying to understand who Jesus is. So Mark begins his gospel in this way. Mark chapter 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Now we won't have time to go into that. Now, Mark's whole thesis is contained in that verse. It's not the beginning of a system. It's not about rules and do's and don'ts. This gospel is about a person called Jesus, his surname ain't Christ, is a title, and he's the son of God. And right there in that one verse is contained, see, multitude of so much to explore. And if you were there in the first century, 
it raises some natural questions but because we've forgotten the context of what we're reading we read that verse one and we we sprint on to the rest no that's verse one is your key to understanding the whole of mark because that's what he's about remember the word gospel was not a religious word the word gospel is an epic announcement something great is happening it's calling your attention to a, a, a an amazing event for example it was used of Augustus Caesar when he was born it was the gospel announcement now you can't say it's not a religious event when Augustus Caesar was born the word is calling people's attention it's like a big notice to an, a monumental event reading that in the first century when mark wrote this would have asked mark what's monumental about this the beginning of the gospel of jesus about a person his name tells us a lot about himself yahweh is salvation it's the greek version of the hebrew name yehoshua or joshua yahweh saves yahweh is salvation and they would be familiar that the word Christos or Messiah is not a surname but a title the anointed one Jesus the anointed one the son of God and son is not like we understand it in the western world like Isaiah is my son Moses is my son but rather he does things that only God can do he does God things and that he is God so what's the natural question you're gonna ask Mark Mark prove it show me how this is good news show me how Jesus saves show me how Jesus is the promised Messiah the fulfillment of all those promises show me how this one is God show me show me prove it to me and what Mark does in his first part of the chapter 8 verse 27 Mark is concerned with demonstrating who is Jesus and the second part of Mark is all about what did he come to do why did he come but in proving who Jesus is, in answering the question, who is Jesus, in the first eight chapters, Mark will demonstrate um, Jesus' sonship, messiahhood, and how he saves, and all of these things, and good news, by showing all the things he did that are godlike, that only God could do things that only God has the right to do things that are the a sole exclusive privilege of God so we see him healing disease like nobody else he nearly, he nearly banished disease from 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 that area known as Palestine he raises the dead who does that the winds and the waves come of a seasoned fisherman and he wakes up and yawns well I don't know if he yawned but I'm just guessing and he goes shh be still and it's perfect stillness he does all these things and then he does things that hyperlinks wink wink points back to Old Testament stories and he does that deliberately. In fact, all the gospel writers do that deliberately. It's a literary tool they all employ to show Jesus is the greater sacrifice. Jesus is the greater Israel. Jesus is greater than Adam. Jesus is greater than Moses. Because he's doing the greater Exodus. Jesus, on and on and on and so on. And keep this in mind as we come to the story of these three men and Mark presents these three men one after the other 
I always tell you, forget the chapter divisions. That's a modern invention. I want you to note all of these three men that Mark presents to us. Note these three things about them. All three of them find themselves in a situation they can do nothing about. Some of it came naturally, some of it maybe because of their own sin. But whatever caused it, they find themselves in a situation that they cannot deliver themselves from. That's number one. Number two, I want you to note, all three of them, because of their situation, are ostracized. Ostracized is a big word to mean they were removed from community. They were removed from full participation in society. They were hindered because of their situation. And all three of them encountered Jesus. And because of their encounter with Jesus, they're never the same again. The encounter is evident. You're not questioning, did it happen, did it not happen? The encounter is evident. Those are the three things I want you to note. They're all in a situation that could not affect, they could not change themselves. Their situation removed them from community or full participation in society. And thirdly, the encounter with Jesus brought about a transformation that was evident to all. Well, let's look at these three men. Just, just be comfortable. Just be comfortable. Just walk with me. Let's consider the first man. Mark chapter 1 verse 40. So we have the leper. Now, anyone who knows anything about leprosy, um, in general, also from scripture, it's a skin ailment of varying degrees and it's very unpleasant as well. But also the thing is this, I believe the leprosy we have here is one where it was of the type where it affects the skin in such a way that it has deformed the man. Because you need to understand leprosy is because the nerves are affected and then because you can't feel, you lose your, your feelings, a lot of people, um, apart from getting infections, they also lose fingers and limbs and what parts of the body. And really you are slowly dying, in, in a sense you're rotting day by day. And also you are highly infectious. It should somebody come in contact with you, especially the oozing um, pus or water that comes from some of your sores, you would infect that person straight away. And here is this man who is a leper. And he approaches Jesus. Now this was a bold thing because in those days, lepers had their own area that was designated for people who had that ailment. And sometimes their families or um, kind people would take food out to these people where they were. But should you come across a leper while walking on the byways and highways, the leper is obligated to say, leper, leper. So you would know a leper's coming and you'd, you know, you'd be aware. And the leper would move out of the way or you would move out of the way. Some of them had bells that would ring to warn people that they, they've got leprosy and people would move out of the way. But in general, they were not allowed amongst the general populace. Very sad existence. So this man comes to Jesus and sees him and notice what he says. He's imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. 
Now what do you find strange about what you ask Jesus? Read the, read, look at your Bible, just humor me. Look at your Bible, it says, if you will, you can make me clean. What do you find strange? What word do you find strange there? In fact, if you look, look at this, and even, even in, in the text we read in 2 Kings chapter 5, we see the same word. What word would you expect him to ask Jesus? To heal him, right? But he does use the word heal. What's the word he uses? Clean. And that's because if you go to Leviticus chapter 14, um, I think 15 as well, in that section, the word that's employed most of the time is the word clean. If you had a skilled ailment, you were considered unclean. And because you're unclean, you're not allowed to socialize with the general populace. You have to be what? Removed. Because no unclean thing is allowed in God's presence. And allowed in God's, amongst God's sanctified holy people. And definitely you could not go to the temple to offer any sacrifices and worship. Because you were unclean. He says to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. But he, he says something else as well. Look what he says. If you will. He's not questioning Jesus' power. He's questioning his willingness. This is, remember I told you, these are sermons in their own right. There's so much I'm, I'm leaving out. But he's using here redemption language. Why do I say this? In the process of redemption, there's always something or someone to be redeemed. Okay? Again, the word redemption was a commerce term, a market term, a business term. It meant this, there's always something or someone to be redeemed. And then, secondly, there's a price to redeem that person. Thirdly, you have to qualify to be the redeemer of that thing or person. Not just anyone. But here's the key. Fourthly, are you willing to read? And we have a wonderful illustration of that in the Old Testament book of Ruth. Who's read Ruth before? Yeah. Now in the story of Ruth, when Ruth was to be redeemed, there was another person before the eventual redeemer, Boaz. He could pay the price. He qualified to redeem Ruth. But you know what happened? He wasn't willing to redeem. So what happened? It now went to the next person being Boaz. Who qualified to redeem her. But here's the key thing. He was willing to redeem her. Hence re Ruth was redeemed. So this man in this one little sentence is speaking so much. If you will, you can make me clean. Redeem me. Redeem me. He's seen Jesus as a redeemer. This is the king who redeems. And what we we'll see now, not only is the king who redeems, he's powerful to redeem. He qualifies to redeem. And he's willing to redeem. But I'm unclean. But I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gangster. I'm a murderer. I've done this in my past. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, I do sex work on the streets. I do things like this. I'm a drunk. I'm a drug addict. You don't understand how, ba how bad I am. He can make you clean. But really... I hear you, I know you've been try trying to be nice, Joshua, but you don't understand how unclean I feel, how dirty I feel, how so out of it I feel. This is the king who's willing to redeem, who's able to redeem, who's powerful to redeem, who qualifies to redeem. And look at what happens here. I don't have time to go through all of it. Look at the compassion of the king. He stretches out his hand and he touches him. He
He touches what you're not supposed to touch. If you touched him, you too were rendered what? Unclean. But what do we find? Oh, there's so much temple imagery here. And how God is the one whose blessing flows throughout his people. And he brings cleansing to the temple, to the people, to the land. That's for another day. But Jesus is that king, the king redeemer, the redeemer king, who has power over sin and all the effects of sin. And he cannot be affected by sin, but he's the one who can dominate, who has destroyed the power of sin and dealt sin a death blow. His compassion, so compassionate, he stretches out and he touches it. And what did Jesus says? I will be clean. No waving of the hands. No drama like we see in some churches. Slap a few people on the head. Jump around on the stage. Make a lot of hullabaloo to look like as if you're super, uber spiritual. You know, I've had people come for prayer with me here. And I would simply open the word, read a passage of scripture, and use that to pray for people. And some people would look at you. Now, this is not Vulcan Baptist Church people. Like I told you, a lot of my work are people not members of this church. And they would look at me and say, is that it? Because they're expecting magic. They're expecting drama. They're expecting a lot of theater. Maybe for me to walk up and down in the study, stamp my feet, throw some holy water in the air. I don't know. Jesus just says, I will be clean. And this is one of the misunderstandings about the gospel as well. Again, back to Mark's intention. People look at the gospel accounts and say, well, Jesus did that, so that means, ergo, therefore, we can do the same. No, the gospel writers are uniquely showing you how special Jesus is by the things he says and does. And Mark is demonstrating here for the story of this leper that Jesus is the Redeemer King who is willing and able to save. You see, leprosy is something we cannot cure even today. We can inoculate against it, but we can't cure it. Like I've told you many times, we only understood bacteria in, in the in, in uh, mid to late 19th century. Go to the priest as Moses commanded. The priest should have concluded, God is an army. Who is this? Why is your skin like a baby's? Imagine what that person, Google, if you want, Google leprosy. So you understand how bad this can get. But imagine this man deformed by his ailment. And Jesus says, I will be clean. And immediately, Mark tells us, imagine the restoration. Maybe lost fingers have grown back. The crippled leg is straightened. The stump is no longer a stump. A foot has grown. And the skin is better than any beauty product out there. Baby soft skin, renewed. Hair restored face restored not the leprosy lion look can you imagine and by going to the priest the priest would have wondered what power who did this God must be here so that's the first man moving swiftly to the second man the paralytic now notice here and many people including myself I focused on the wrong thing in this passage. We focus on the four men. These are four friends who carry him to Jesus. So we should do the same. But notice here. Here is a man, a paralytic. We all know what a paralytic is. 
And those that have been in person who is, again, cannot do anything about his situation, like the leper, but he's dependent on other people. And he's carried by his friends to meet Jesus. So they go there, we're told the story, there's a massive crowd, can't get through the doors, so they go, as you do, through the man's roof and lower him to Jesus. Imagine the scene. And as the roof is crumbling above the crowd in the house, Jesus looks up. And once again, whenever you read the scripture and you see something there that shouldn't be there or sounds odd, is a clue to the meaning of the passage or what the point of the passage is. Jesus looks up. Now, I want you to imagine if you were a paralytic, totally disabled, dependent on other people for your existence. And you heard Jesus, someone like Jesus exists, what would you desire from him? Healing, right? And to be fully restored, yeah? Well, Jesus looks up at him and says, your sins are forgiven. If I was that guy, the paralytic, on that mat, I'd be bawling like, are you kidding me? My sins are forgiven me. Can you not see my situation? Thank you for forgiving my sins. But could you like do something about my limbs as well? And this is a man whose interaction with community or society would have been greatly reduced. You see, you need to understand the mindset of the people in those days. We see this in actually in the Gospel of John. Do you remember when Jesus and his disciples went to the pool and they saw that disabled man? And what was the question the disciples asked Jesus? Who sinned, this man or his parents? We see it in African society as well. Uh, we're looking at uh, African people, you're looking at me as if like, what are you talking about? The African mindset is what? When you see a disabled person, you assume what? Some kind of karma, right? Something bad, some witchcraft. Or something like that. And that's why, sadly, in our African communities, we hide disabled people. Because disabled people are seen as a shameful thing. It's wrong. It's terribly wrong. So, because of that, when people saw like a... It's like the worst your ailment, your wor the worst your disability, therefore, he must have sinned. And maybe it was a result of sin, we don't know. But Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven you. You see, some of you out there are not even aware of your true condition. Maybe you think yourself righteous. You think yourself holy, that you're okay. And you know you've got issues, but actually you don't realize what your real issue is. You're like this paralytic. You're all right on the outside, but actually there's a greater problem. You see, by society standards, you look smart, you've got a good job, you love your families, you pay your tax, and so on. But actually you don't see what your real problem is. It's that you need your sins forgiven you. Your real issue is sin. Jesus says to the man, I'm paraphrasing, oh, I could heal you, I, I can restore your limbs, but let me deal with your real problem, your sins have forgiven you. And then Mark wonderfully records for us what the Pharisees say. And you know what? The Pharisees are right, yet they're wrong. They're right. This man is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but... They're right. This is God's territory. Forgiving sins is God's territory. But they're wrong. Because why? They don't realize the identity of the man who stood in their midst. So Jesus says to them, here's a very simple illustration. You can almost see him going, oh boy, I have to do this again. Which is easier? I'm standing here before all of you. Now, if I look at Uncle Ernest 
And I said, Uncle Ernest, there are four angels standing by beside you. How, how do I prove that? Yeah, I can't, can I? And, then, and it's so sad many people go to churches that you get that kind of stuff. You don't know that. But let's say I say to Uncle Ernest, Uncle Ernest, there are four angels beside you and they're telling me they want to lift you up. You're going, yeah. But all of a sudden, Uncle Ernest starts rising up right before all of us. You're going to believe me, aren't you? So Jesus says, which is easier? You see, I could say stuff that I can't prove. Your sins are forgiven you. And he says this, the key is verse 10. But so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Pick up your man and go home. The demonstration of the man, be, notice, he didn't even say, be healed, possess. He just tells him, he tells a paralytic, pick up your mat and go home. That's the instruction. What kind of power is that? So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth. What is he demonstrating again? Jesus. This king is God. He does things only God can do. He does things that only God has the right to do, which is forgive sins. They're supposed to worship and glorify God and go, wow. The Pharisees instead are all plotting, how do we kill this guy? But see, Jesus is the king who's not only willing to redeem sinners, but he has the right to forgive sinners. He has the authority to forgive sinners. And in dealing with your sin problem, you can be made whole again. And we we'll read, the man gets up and people say, We've ne we never saw anything like this. Their minds are blown. But the key there is, Jesus does God things. And by the way, notice the term, Jesus always refers to himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Really did he refer to himself as a Christ. The righteous did, Paul does, and all of those. But Jesus, by and large, refers to himself as the Son of Man. And we've, we've spent time on this before in the past. But this is largely in reference to the vision of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. The one who looks like a son of man. Again, remember, even when the Sanhedrin, before the Sanhedrin, the high priest, Caiaphas, tore his, his garment, is in relation to Jesus' claim as being that son of man. They understood exactly what he's saying. And Jesus is saying to them, so that you may know that I am he, and I have the authority and the power to forgive sins. Take up your mat and go home. So Jesus is that king who is able and willing to redeem. No matter how unclean you feel, how unworthy you feel, he can do something about your situation and he has the right to forgive. And let's go to the last man, the third man. So here we see Jesus went out again beside the sea and again the crowd and as he passed by we're told he sees Levi the son of Alphaeus who we're told is a tax collector so now some of you are thinking all right Josh we understand the the leper he's got that ailment we understand the paralytic both can't do anything about the situation what's this got to do with that now the other two guys we don't have their names but this third guy we've got his name and that's significant because this is Levi, who we know as Matthew, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. But you need to understand, even though today we still dislike the tax man, right? Are you with me? I mean, people taking on hard-earned money. But you need to understand the context of how they understood tax men in their days. Now, a tax collector... In those days, 
was someone who was considered a traitor. In fact, worse than a sinner, if you can get such a thing. And I'll prove my point in a minute. A tax collector was usually we would have a Jewish person who would collect money for the occupying oppressive Roman Empire. But they didn't just collect money, they collected more than they should. And they swindled people and were very rich people. So they were considered turncoats, traitors. And if you were a tax collector, you were not allowed to fellowship with God's covenant people. You were removed. You were ostracized. In fact, if a tax collector sat on a, on a bench and you then sat on that bench after the tax collector sat on it, you would be considered unclean. If you ate with a tax, tax collector or fellowship with a tax collector, you likewise were ostracized with that person. So the tax collector usually would lose family relations, religious relations, really not considered no more part of God's covenant people, no more part of the commonwealth of Israel because you've betrayed your people and you're worse than a sinner. In other words, you're beyond redemption. You're beyond saving. You are a son of perdition, a son of hell, a son of destruction. And Jesus comes along and he says to this son of perdition, son of destruction, hated tax collector, ostracized of community, worse than a sinner, Jesus says to him, follow me. What? And we're told, not just that, he reclines at the table. He has a meal with Levi, with Matthew. Listen to this, look at verse 15. And he reclined at the table in his, in his house. And look at this, many, I mean, this one tax collector is bad enough, but a gathering of tax collectors and sinners. Do you see that? And sinners. <laughs> separate categories. That's how bad it is to be a tax collector. You've got your own separate category. Tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Do you want to know how bad a tax collector is? Please, very quickly, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to use Jesus' own words. Matthew 18. And this is the last process for church discipline. Right? If a person will not repent and won't listen to correction, listen to this. Matthew 18, look at verse 17. This is how Jesus says, treat a person in a church who will not repent after being corrected, counseled, and so on. This is how Jesus wants us to treat such a person. Verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Those are Jesus' is a word. Jesus, because he understands how people understood tax collectors. They were hated people. They were abhorred. They were reviled. Ew. And here's Jesus, the same Jesus, sitting down having a meal with him. You need to understand, unlike in the Western world or in our societies here, food, eating, sitting down and eating with somebody is not just functional, it's relational. You're saying to the person, I'm your friend. It's either initiating a friendship or it's an affirmation of a friendship. And Jesus is sitting down with tax collectors and sinners. And there's lots of them. And Matthew uses the opportunity, invites all his friends. Notice who his friends are. 
people who are wretched sinners like him. He encountered Jesus who welcomed him and said, follow me. And what did Matthew do? I'm going to tell all my tax collector friends because those are the only friends he could have. And sinners, all the prostitutes, gangsters, drunks, addicts, all the dregs of society, he invited to the meal. And Jesus reclines with them. And sadly, some of us are like the Pharisees. When they saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why? Because we know God's prophets, holy men, men of God, do not do such things. And that's the problem, isn't it? And sadly, in the church, even we have forgotten the gutter of sin from which God redeemed us. We now play church. We play church. We're here on Sunday morning looking smart. And unlike Matthew, we don't go out to call sinners anymore. We want good people. You know why? Because we've forgotten that we were once tax collectors and sinners. We've forgotten that we were once paralytics and lepers. And maybe you're listening to this message, you're sitting here this morning, and you feel like a tax collector and a sinner. You know for sure. You see, you may excuse the leper and the paralytic, but maybe you're like Matthew, Levi. You're like, yeah, I get this, but you need to understand, I was willfully sinful. I, I lived in sin. I danced in sin. I reveled in sin. I was unapologetic about my sinful life. No one's going to love me. No one's going to forgive me. I'll never be holy enough. I'll never be good enough. Jesus says, you are the right candidate for the gospel. I'm looking for people like you. What? But don't you want good people? No, no one's good. Like Job said, how can a man be right before God? How can any man be right before God? So Jesus wisely answers them. Verse 17. Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And Jesus' point is this, if you sit there, if you think you are so good that you don't need Jesus, you don't need the blood of the Lamb of God, you don't need the cross, you don't need Jesus, the King, the Redeemer King, the Forgiving King, the Compassionate King, that you remain in your sins. I was watching a program on TV and you see these programs and boy, we are such fools. And here is a, is a program about the guy is supposed to be a former priest and it talks about how he no longer preaches that doesn't believe in God, but you know, we ought to be good and that we're all inherently good. And if we just exercise that good, we'd all get along in the world. I thought, what utter nonsense and rubbish. To begin with, he could, without God, how do you define good? What is he talking about? Being good loses meaning and purpose without God. Nonsense. But the message of the Bible is, we're not good. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Again, Romans 3, Paul says, every part of our being is corrupt. We cannot save ourselves. Like these three men, the leper, the paralytic, the tax collector, all three could do nothing about this situation. And that's the situation we all find ourselves in, every human being. And all of us, because of our sins, are removed from fellowship from God's people, God's covenant people, God's blessing. But praise God, an encounter with Jesus not only deals with your situation where you cannot save yourself, 
but it does more than save us. It brings us into communion with God. We are saved to be sons of the living God. To be his children, to be part of his family. To be brought back in to community. Because Jesus, the King, has removed every stumbling block, everything that hindered us from being part or partaking in the blessings of God. Jesus has dealt with that. His blood has washed away our sins. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy now sitting at your table, Jesus, thank you. We sit at this table like Levi and eat and feast because we're friends, brothers, family. What's your excuse? The word of God says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. Whether you're sitting here this morning or you're listening to this message through some platform, Jesus can save you. Jesus qualifies to redeem you. Jesus is willing to save you. There is no sin you could have committed that disqualifies you from being saved. And that applies to everybody. But to the Christians, you did not save yourself. He saved you. Like Paul said in Galatians, you didn't start this. So why are you now trying to complete this in your own strength? Trust in the one who gave you his spirit, who animated you, saved you, regenerated you, and gave you life. He who started by the spirit shall complete the work he started. And is not dependent on how good you can be. But throw yourself upon his grace, upon his mercy, and that in that it will keep working in you. For he's the one who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. To both Christians and non-Christians I say to you, come to the fountain filled with blood that's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We're so undeserving. So undeserving. But we're reminded this morning of the disease that only you can cure. We do not have the power to affect our own situation, but you alone. May you, Father, most graciously attend to us. Attend to anyone who hears this message. May you, Father, may it please you to work a work so powerful that you will set at liberty all those who are bound by the shackles of sin and death and devils. And to the believers, may you remind us of your saving power. Maybe we're bruised and battered by life and the, our own sins and ignorance and, and stubbornness and hardened hearts. May you work again in us. May you revive us, O oh God. Hallelujah. Thine be the glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.